Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to episode number eight of the Trifecta Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Frank Spencer. I'm with my co-hosts, Coop and David. Uh, we got a big show planned for you today. We're going to talk about the Masters, talk about um, NFL news, talk about uh, opening day weekend of baseball uh, in the major leagues. You know, we've talked a lot about Major League Baseball here on this channel so far. Um, if you've not subscribed to the channel yet, we are at 31 subscribers as of this point. We're on the quest for 100. We can get there with your help. We have, we need your help. Subscribe to the channel. Do it right now. Um, I'm going to kick off today's show with a little bit of uh, Masters talk. Uh, anybody that knows me knows I love golf. Tiger Woods playing in the Masters tournament. Uh, first competitive golf round apart from the PNC Championship when he played with the Sun. Um, four rounds so low, him versus the golf course. It was really cool to see Tiger Woods back out on the course playing uh, alongside, you know, the top players in the world. You know, somebody like that who is probably arguably the greatest of all time in his sport. Um, after a lot of injuries, a lot of surgeries, the unfortunate car accident a couple years ago, seeing him back on uh, on the greens at Augusta is pretty cool. Um, didn't have the greatest week, but he did make the cut. Did finish four grueling rounds of golf uh, walking the course there at Augusta. is no easy feat. Um, also, congratulations to Scotty Scheffler, or Scotty Scheffler. I messed up his name there. Uh, Scheffler uh, won at 10 under par just a few short hours ago. Um, the guy was on fire all weekend long. Uh, only guy to shoot under par all four rounds. Uh, had a little shaky uh, three putt there at the end um, to double bogey the last hole, but you know, the nerves got the best of him. He's lucky. He had a five five lead cushion or five shot cushion, so he was all right with that. Um, I was telling the boys before we come on air. Uh, I kind of watched just about every hole uh, through my television. I have ESPN Plus to do featured groups. Um, got to watch Tiger all weekend. Watch Scotty. Watched um, John Rom and Tiger play. Uh, was it today? And then uh, he was paired up with uh, Joaquin Neiman for the first two rounds. Uh, I forget who he was paired up with on Saturday, but um, tough, tough, tough weekend for Tiger. Don't get me wrong, but I think a lot of it could be fatigue. And the golf course chewed a lot of people up and spit them out this week. Apart from the few guys there at the top, um, there's some big names that missed the cut, uh, namely Jordan Spieth, Brooks Kepka, um, among others. Louis Ustazen had to even withdraw from the first round or after the first round for, from an injury. But um, congrats to Tiger for on his comeback. He did mention after uh, in an interview that he said that he would be uh, taking it, you know, week by week. He's definitely probably not going to play every week. Uh, going to play the big ones, though. He for sure guaranteed appearance at St. Andrews for the Open Championship, which is the next major. Um, pretty excited about that. You know, golf is better with Tiger in it. So um, congrats to Tiger again. Master champion, Scotty Scheffler. Um, has won four out of six starts this year. New number one in the world, overtaking John Rahm for that spot. Rightfully deserved. Uh, the dude is on fire right now, and and he's one of the hottest players in the world right now. So, um, moving on. What do you guys? Do you guys have thoughts on the Masters? Do y'all watch it? Oh yeah, I had it on as much as I could. I don't have ESPN Plus like you, so I had to watch the CBS feeds in the afternoons. Uh, two big takeaways. What a day by Rory McIlroy, seven yes. under to finish second. And I mean, if you all haven't seen it, go back and watch him hole out on eighteen. You you won't see a guy just more purely excited to have a ball go in a hole than that. And then uh, my second takeaway, which my bet, I don't bet a lot on on stuff, but you know, I do a dollar here and there. And I really like to bet. I, I like to hedge against my happiness. So I am not a Bryson DeChambeau fan. I'm not. But I was like, you know what? If he's going to win, I want to win some money off him. So I bet a dollar on him. And I will say he is one of those guys that got spit up and chew out. And, you know, he's a polarizing athlete. He's almost like Tiger Woods in that fact where he can absolutely just bomb it off the tee. And everything he does is under a microscope and, um, you know, analyzed by everybody. But, the you know, him – I think it was two years ago now, he said he looks at Augusta as a par 67, where it's a par 72, probably one of the widest, farthest things that should have came out of his mouth. Yeah. And, you know, and then he misses the cut, which, you know, I hedge against my happiness, so I'm pretty happy right now seeing that that uh, Bryson 
has another another year to go before he can chase down his another illustrious green jacket. Yeah, um, and like you said, par sixty seven. There's only one round between all of these players over the whole weekend that was under sixty seven, and that was Rory today. Um, it, it's crazy that you can see that course affect these players, like you said. And honestly, you know, we talked about Tiger a little bit, him coming back and the the course is what caused him to fall off as well. I think fatigue, right? You saw that limp. You didn't see it at all the first day. Second day, it showed up on the downhill and then day three and four, he was limping pretty much the whole time. So maybe he gets back. One thought I had kind of came up, you know, that, Nicholas conversation. He was like, I root for you for six, but not for seven. Do you think Tiger comes back if he's already got the most majors? If he's ahead of Nicholas, do you think he even tries again? Or is he chasing that ghost like, you know, I think LeBron is as well. That's why LeBron's moving around the NBA. He's chasing that ghost, trying to get those rings. I think if you're as competitive as Tiger Woods has been for as long as Tiger Woods has been competitive, it's kind of hard to just up and quit. Like, you know, your time is coming and you know, it's, you know, it's, it's 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 a, fir- a very short amount of time before you're not going to be able to play competitive golf on the PGA Tour consistently. Now there are guys that are 60 years old still playing in events, and I think Tiger will continue to do that until probably the day he dies. Um, but I don't think that I don't see him unless something miraculous happens. I don't see him winning another major. Um, mm-hmm. I, I do think he can win some smaller tournaments here and there, but I don't think he's going to play in those. I think he yeah. will play in the majors. If he, I mean, I'm sure he's going to get sponsors exemptions. I mean, you have to play your way to even get in those. But he's freaking Tiger Woods, so there's somebody who's going to let him in. Uh, well, he has he champion win. exemptions on everything. Yeah, he's won everything. <laughs> um, I do. I, I would really like. It would be cool to see him play the Champions Tour, um, which is the way I've talked about this before, like the older tour with the older guys. Uh, Phil Mickelson played a little bit on the Champions Tour. Bernard Langer, Miguel Angel Jimenez, the most interesting man in golf. Uh, those guys, they still play every week and they're competitive, but the competition is levelized a little bit. You're not playing against 22 year, 23 year olds um, every week that can hit it a mile. And, you know, these prodigies, like I, we said last week, or I said last week, that we're in a time and age where we have the greatest athletes that ever walked the face of the earth. And that is the same yeah. for golfers. Um, you see every year a brand new name show up. A couple of years ago, it's, it's, it's been Colin Morikawa. It's been Jordan Spieth, Justin Thomas. And now it's Scotty Scheffler, who is very young. This is just his third Masters appearance, and he won it. Um, yeah. So the game's, the game's getting younger. It's not, it's, not holding, it's not waiting around for anyone. Even Tiger Woods, uh, at some point in time, he's going to have to just make a decision for himself and say, hey, I'm done playing competitive golf at this level. And then transition over to the Champions League and then play there, which he's going to be good there too because, um, you know, most people are. You know, tons of other major champions play in that tour. And it's it's a little bit less, I want to say, demanding of a schedule. Yeah. So something like that is where I'll see Tiger playing in the next couple of years once he hits that, that age. I think, yeah. I think he's just to the point where he doesn't know, any, he doesn't know anything else. Um, right, yeah, he's, he's competitor through and through. I would say there is some of that aspect of chasing the ghost because he is so hyper competitive and he wants to have all the records. But I think it, at the end of the day, it comes down to, he's going to go out there and try to win every major. So I agree. I mean, he kind of said it today. He's not going to play the little tournaments. He's going to play the big ones. He committed to, um, the open in England or Europe or wherever it is this year. So that's kind of what I see Tiger doing for the next at least probably two, three years at most, especially as Charlie Woods, who is, you know, the, the Twitter, TikTok and sensation where see where he comes up and goes to school and all that. But I don't think Tiger's done. I mean, Phil won Phil won uh well the US Open last year at fifty, oldest guy to ever win that. And Tiger's only forty six. And, you know, Watching Tiger on Wednesday and Thursday, I mean, he was a specimen. I mean, that guy yeah. is jacked. And, yeah. I mean, we talk was... about the young guys who are the long bombers. Tiger's the one who started all that. Yeah. So, you know, I wouldn't put it past him that 
it's Tiger. He's competitive. Yeah, I know. I know everybody in our generation and above us. We idolize the man because when you think of success, you think of Tiger Woods and you think of Serena Williams. I mean, I don't think there's and Tom Brady. I mean, it's crazy how many goats we've seen in our lifetime. But um, I, I don't think he he's going to dominate on the senior tour champions tour, but I think he's still, he's going to ride the PGA those exemptions as for as long as he can. And you can yeah. still, you can still get into these major championships from the senior tour. Yeah. Um, uh, they had Stuart sink was in it. Fred couples who was one of Tiger's best friends. Uh, Bernard Langer was in it this year. Uh, you know, they don't finish very good. They some most of them didn't even make the cut, but here you have Tiger Woods, you know, looking as good, if not better than most players that end up finishing in the top 25 uh, those first two days. Uh, I do think fatigue probably got him a little bit and walking that far. He did have yep. a lot of practice rounds, but, you know, his practice rounds are nine holes a couple of days a week. It's not 18 for four days in a row. And I don't know about you, like, if I run a golf cart playing 18 holes, I get pretty tired after the day. So um, it just shows you that golf is – you have to be like super athletic to be a good golfer. Uh, yeah. You may not have to look like one. You may not have to look like an athlete, but you got to have some sort of athleticism to continue that for a significant period of time. That's probably 20 hours worth of golf in four days. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Tiger, you know, even yesterday, I don't know, I was watching one hole. He had a 360 yard drive. Yeah. Like that's up there. You're not seeing that very often. And I think, the, I get the competitiveness. It's all he knows he wants to play, but him only playing in majors, that says something, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely. He's not just staying to play golf. Like, he's staying to win. He's trying to get up there. Well, I've mean, got one other observation on the Masters, aside from Tiger, aside from the players. There's been years. This is the only golf event I've watched. I've just found it peaceful, almost therapeutic. There's, like, this tranquility to it. The scenery is amazing. And I realized this weekend what it reminds me of. That's a funeral visitation. <laughs> okay. So s- stick with me. All right. You've oh, got man. like so much reverence and respect from the people that are talking. Like it's more hushed and whispered than any other announcement at any other tournament all year long. You no have these extended. Like you're in, yeah. you're in a booth somewhere. They can't hear you. Why are you whispering? They're, you're not allowed to do anything above a walk on that course. That is a rule, right? You Like you can't jog to your place. People literally chase balls that go into the woods like the entire crowd will go running after a ball it's not going to move it's just every little detail everybody is so invested in paying so much attention to it and then they have these extended camera cuts where it's just scenery and classical music like orchestral music for minutes and i was like i feel like i'm sitting in the funeral home like that's what it reminds me of and in a way that's peaceful you know you're getting that closure you're getting that reset so i just had to call that out that's a pretty good analogy there. I, yeah. I dig that a lot. I never would have thought of that, but you are exactly right. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, one of the rules that I love, I'm pretty sure this is right, they don't allow cell phones on the ground. So you don't, if you look oh. into the crowd, you don't see everybody just sitting there with their cell phone making a recording or, you know, sending, making a TikTok, making a Snapchat or whatever. It's everybody there is fully invested on that next shot and where that ball's yeah. going to go. And I think that's a big thing that I hate today whenever I go to a sporting event. It's just like you like you watch NBA games or college basketball games and you see people on the front row get hit in the face because they're on their phone. It's like, <laughs> what? You know how many people have died yeah. to have those seats right now? Get off your yeah. phone. You know, I never knew that. And now that you think about it, I'm looking back and, and kind of reminiscing about watching the crowds. And not, I did, you don't see one person, even following Tiger Woods, you don't see one person with their phone out videoing them. No, nah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a rule. It would almost have to be to keep that many people off of their phone. Yeah. So huh, that, that's pretty cool. But I will yeah. say the state of golf right now, I, I know whenever we were in high school, like everybody was searching for that next Tiger when Tiger kind of fell off there. Um, I know people wanted it to be Rory. And then it was Justin Thomas and Spieth and all that. And I think golf is in such a great spot right now where there are so many household names that can go out there and win a, win a Masters. I mean, heck, we have Scotty Shuffler, who's been on the Ryder Cup team for – I know he was last year. Yeah. So, it's like, you know, he goes out and he's won – what would you say, Frank, four of his last six? Four of his last six starts. He had three wins already this season leading up to that start in the Masters. And uh, that was three out of five, I believe. So, yeah. 
Dude's hot. And Cameron Smith, who uh, <laughs> was, I get he finished four or five under. Uh, he was in the final five group. under. Yep. Um, tied for third. He's already won twice this year. Yeah, and then you got Colin Morikawa, Justin Thomas, Spieth, Brooks McElroy. Kepka, McElroy, DeChambeau. The list goes on and on, and I think golf's just in a, such a great spot right now where they used to be chasing for that next next tiger. Yeah, you had a lot of, like a, I think of wrestling all the time, like you have those mid-card guys. Right now, you have a lot of heavyweights uh, that can win at any moment. Like when Brooks Kepka shows up to a major, you expect him to be up there because that's just what he does. Um, the dude's won probably for four or five majors already, I, I believe. And he, he'll even tell you that he don't even practice unless it's a major championship. Uh, so the golf golf is changing. The game is changing. Um, it's not. It's no longer this, you know, old school, ethical, you know, follow the rules type deal. Now you have some personality with it. And I think that's helping it grow the game for sure. Golf is one of the fastest growing sports there is. Um, and I know that because I, I, mean, I started playing golf during – uh, what is it 2020 when COVID hit is that when that hit when we all closed down for that yeah. summer and didn't yeah. go back to school yeah so I started playing golf then like religiously like sitting going to play golf like three or four times a week and I just instantly hooked to it because it's something that I've I've grown towards I've grown to be more of a competitor although I can't play sports anymore so it's the one thing you can do until you're old and, and, and wrinkly and you can still be competitive I won the money at the golf course this week uh, during spring break and, and I'm terrible. So, I mean, you can still go out and have fun and be competitive with your friends and other people. And I mean, once you buy your clubs, you, you can just keep those for the rest of your life. You don't have to keep upgrading. Like you you can just play. And it's pretty accessible for everyone as well too. All right, guys. Uh, love the golf discussion. Um, Moving on, we have uh, also, it is opening weekend of the Major League Baseball season. Uh, my Cincinnati Reds split the series 2-2 two and two against the Atlanta Braves. Uh, big highlight, big shout-out to uh, Hunter Green, who made his debut today. We have, I believe he went four or five innings, I'm not sure. Uh, struck out six. I saw a stat earlier that uh, the Reds have, they had two, two players that have thrown a hundred plus mile an hour fastballs in their careers. One of them was Luis Castillo. I think he's thrown probably 20 fastballs at a hundred plus throughout his career. Uh, today, Hunter Green threw 20, 20 fastballs that were a hundred plus, uh, in one game. So, um, his changeups were sitting at 88 to 92. And I believe his, he had through a couple sliders that sit around 85. But the dude is a stud, and I'm pretty pretty excited to see what he can do for the Reds. Any other notes that you guys have about opening weekend? Uh, Jose Abreu rocking a goatee ponytail. I don't know if you guys caught that. Not <laughs> something I've seen in baseball, but he had it straight up, like almost braided. It was uh, fun to see that character coming in. But, no, it's just great to see everybody out there. Um, I think the face of the league, which to me right now is Shohei Otani, I mm -hmm. think he's kind of passed – his teammate for that crown as far as it goes to the public. And, you know, no, so. he's, he's the big name. Uh, first player in MLB history to throw a team's first pitch and also receive it for the season where he was batting lead off for them. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's cool for him to just find a, yet another way to get into the history books on opening weekend. And then we had some excitement, a couple of bench clearing. I don't think we actually had a fight if we did. I missed it, but I know the bench is cleared in a couple of games. Uh, a lot of, hit batsman those are always fun to see uh mm -hmm. it reminds me of when yasiel pui tried to fight the entire pittsburgh pirates team <laughs> that i will forever remember that image of him just just him and he's got his he's cocked back with his uh, fist and all you see is pirates players like he's fighting the whole team and then you have amir garrett doing the same thing not too long after that but um i believe that happened during the opening weekend as well uh, a couple years ago I'm going to derail this conversation. You know, Frank, Frank's a Reds fan. I'm a former Reds fan. Uh, Frank, <laughs> do you, do you, uh, looking back on it, do you trade Yasiel Puig for Trevor Bauer now? 
given all you know, how much the Reds didn't do, win with Trevor Bauer. Do you do you still keep them uh, at, as they were when they were traded, like their talent levels? Yeah, yeah, no. I keep Puig. Oh, I, I do 100%. And, I keep and, Puig because he's a person. I, Bauer's a personality, don't get me wrong. And he's a pretty good pitcher. <laughs> but, I mean, he won a Cy Young. He calls it the Mickey Mouse Cy Young because it was a shortened season. He won the Cy Young, and then all of his other crap happened. Um, we won't get into all that. Still not playing. I'm. I don't know if he if he'll ever get reinstated. I'm sure he will. But um, Puig was the heart and soul of that team at that time. Like he knew he was getting traded. Like he knew he was not a red anymore, and still tried to fight Pittsburgh. Take it up for his teammates. That's the kind of guy I want on my team, man. Uh, I know my friends that I hang out with here that watch the Reds. We love Yasiel Puig. He get up there and lick the bat, hit bombs. It's awesome. Now with the universal DH. Somebody like that would be helpful right now. <laughs> yeah. that I, I agree with that 100%. That's how I was going with it. You know, you have a guy that would, who would stand up for everybody. He was the face of the franchise, whether you wanted him to be or not. He was just a polarizing athlete. And, I mean, looking back on it for the Reds, I mean, yeah, you got a Cy Young out of the deal, and the guy is now over in the Korean Baseball League. So, I mean, yeah, for the Reds, they won that trade. But, you know, looking back on it, it's like, man, the Reds lost their spark a little bit when they when they did that trade, but but I will say, you know, I saw that he's still hitting bombs over the KBL, so I'm hoping hoping he makes his debut back or re debut back in the league here soon. Somebody will get hurt. Somebody oh, will yeah. need somebody. It's oh, happened. Yeah. yeah. And then my other uh, thing is uh, back to Shohei Otani. You know. They changed the rule for him this year so that if you're dh in and you're, you know, the starting pitcher, if you come out, you can still stay in the game, yep. much in line with high school, and I believe college does that the same way. <laughs> so, you know, it's nice to see the MLB adapting to some – how the game is being played. And, you know, it's not always now the, the PO life isn't, isn't you know, just strictly MLB. I mean, now we got two-way players in the show, yep. and it's awesome to see – the, the electricity that Shohei Otani is bringing to the Los Angeles Angels because they need it. I think it'll be cool because uh, in high school, they just come up with this rule a couple of years ago. I think it was right before COVID hit and they shut that season down. But you could have a – if you present the lineup at the plate, you can designate a player as your pitcher or DH or a player DH. So not only can you have a pitcher start the game on the mound and then when he comes out, let him stay in the lineup and hit, but you can have your first baseman start off playing first, and then if you want to make a defensive sub, take him out, put a better defensive first baseman in there, then your first baseman that was in the field can still hit. Now, that's something that would probably be pretty cool to see later on in the major leagues as well. Um, I don't know if we talked about – we talked a long time ago about the different rules, and and I'm not heard any update on any of that. Have you guys heard any updates on any of the rules that we talked about, the rule changes? I've not seen uh, it being – I've not seen it been affected – by anything Mm-mm. yet, but it wasn't a rule change. I think teams were allowed to use it, but some teams are using the uh, electronic pitch yeah, calling. I've, I've seen that signals. as well. Uh, but I've always kind of wanted to get my hands on one of those of. and see how those work. I've seen colleges like Vandy use like the watch. It's not like mm-hmm. a watch, but it looks it's about the size of a watch. Uh, to me, I as think player, the Astros use the watch weird. as well. Like the catcher has one, but it, it looks like very large on his on his wrist. Mm-hmm. For me as a pitcher, if I had a watch on, that that would that would feel weird. I don't know if I'd like it or not. Yeah. So, side note about the DHs. I don't like a DH. Why? I don't think they should be. You don't have somebody in basketball come in to shoot free throws. Right? You so? don't take a person who's playing the majority of the game and then when it stops for this particular moment, like it, what would Shaq have been if they could have pulled him out of the free throw line just to stick somebody else in for that small portion? Yeah, but like basketball games are nonstop though. Like they're continuous. You stop for free throws. Even but you don't yeah. One team doesn't run off the floor and the other team run on the floor at the same time. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Even more reason to not give your players an extra break and take them out of another element of the I game. I love the DH. I don't think pitchers should hit. You should not have a team with an automatic out in your lineup. It's just not It's not an automatic out. Yeah. You're changing rules to keep them in the game. Yeah. Make I, them hit. I kind of agree with Coop here. It's no, no, I don't. It, you play to win the game, and if and you another, 
guy can't hit, don't play him. Or yeah. if he can't, or if he's that good on defense or pitching, take his out. I mean, you, yeah. that's the strategy of it. No, the age all the way. There's a crisis in the MLB on player salaries. We can't pay everybody, but we're creating more jobs. We're creating extra people we have to keep on the roster just you don't for have the to keep spot extra. to hit for somebody that's already on the team. You have somebody already on the team that just steps into that role. You're not, you're not going out and getting an extra roster spot for a DH. You think, yeah, you are. You don't. You you're do not granted an extra roster drop your spot roster size. Just for, it's the roster stays the same. There's players are listed with position of DH. Yeah, David Ortiz. If there's no. If there's no DH, what is that player's position? David Free agency. Or- David Ortiz's war, if he had to play first base, would not. I don't know what it is, but it wouldn't be as high if that guy had to play the field. It, and I think that is 100% true. Would you, yeah. would you rather have guys that focused on pitching, throwing the ball, or would you want position players that also could have to worry about hitting two, throwing the ball? Yeah. No. I mean, there are position players that pitch sometimes yeah. in the need. But... And, and, Not very and, good. And, I mean, I'm a catcher. Being a catcher is way more taxing on the body and mind than pitching. And I have to go out there and hit. So why can't a pitcher? I mean, all he's doing is throwing. We play 162 games a year. I'm asking you to start 32 of them. And in those 32, I'm not going to make you bat. And it's probably yeah. good. It's what probably, is up with that? It's probably two at bats, minimum or max. Yeah, minimum. No. So Max Scherzer is going to play half of thirty games this year. We'll say thirty-five. Say so they pitch him a little extra, and is going to make more than four MLB team payrolls. So be it for thirty-five half games <laughs> because he's not on offense. It doesn't matter. DH all the way, yeah. baby. It makes the game better. I don't want Bronson Arroyo up there with a freaking bat in his hand. You can't say it makes the game better when you want three-point conversions in the NFL to get ready kickers. It's oh, the same I'm... thing. A, a DH is a kicker. I mean, yeah. I mean, you don't see people running on the soccer field. I see field a DH a as a returner. All right, let me ask you this. There are people in the NFL that just return punts. That's all they do. Yeah. I say that's not allowed. There are also position players that return punts. But there are also pitchers like Otani that can still hit. Yeah, and they should. <laughs> but I agree. That, but that's the thing, though, is they are using a roster spot for that guy. They are, yeah. too. They're, you're using a roster spot for a DH. So let me ask you, let me tell you this. The guys that were already DHs are saying DHs. The guys that are in the league that abolished the DH have already had players on that roster that just step into that role. Like, they don't go and, and open a roster spot just for the guy that, have, that has to DH. There's somebody well, already We're going to come back to this goal. conversation next week after we look at the National League signings from the offseason and see how many players that were signed in the offseason for the National League are now DHs. Yeah, what? Albert Pujols, number one. Did he play? Has he played in the game? Oh, I haven't even checked. Oh, yeah, they started him opening day. I mean, he is their left-handed DH, or when they're facing a left-handed pitcher, he is their DH. That is so, 100%. I mean, granted, it's the storybook ending for him and that franchise to come home, yeah. but that's the only reason why they signed him. So now they have to have a right-handed DH as well. That's two <laughs> roster spots and salaries they don't need. So you're talking about DH roster spots, and you were just having a conversation about pitching roster spots. You can't no, have pitchers are... Pitchers are fine. You need the pitchers. I'm saying pitchers hit. You don't need the DH yeah. spot. No, DH all the way. If Make you agree hit. with me, no, no. Bartolo Colon. Uh, that he was a world class athlete. Coop. You don't get many people like Bartolo Colon. Make him hit. <laughs> Blind squirrel finds a nut. No. Uh, no. Madison Bumgarner. I mean, there's so many exceptions to this rule. And yeah. You're telling me, and John Lester, the guy couldn't even throw to first base and he had to hit. MLB, you can define MLB's problem with two rule changes this year. One, we're going to allow DHs everywhere so pitchers don't have to hit. Two, we're going to allow pitchers to keep hitting after they stay in the game. 
What are you talking about? We're gonna allow one of them to do that. Uh, but anyway, I think that the DH in the game of baseball is in the major leagues. Anyway, is the greatest rule they could have ever had. Because oh, wow, yeah, that's, it's the greatest that's a rule. Statement. It's the greatest rule, and here's why: Whoa. you can't expect. All right, you guys got position players out there. When you when you're drafted as a position player, you're expected to do two things: play your spot and hit. Right. Oh, I'd like that another one, and that's play more than thirty games a year. Okay. But not as a position player. Yeah, you're expected to play a hundred to. Uh, yeah, hundred. They're going to. They're going to. Um, when you're drafted as a pitcher, what are they drafting you to do? Play the game of baseball. No, you're lying. <laughs> they're drafting you to throw it across the damn plate and get outs. They're not drafting because, you to get up there and hit, son. That's not. That's not because, why they drafted you. Because that's the rule, right? Yeah, if it, it wasn't, wasn't the rule, they would be drafting differently. Pitchers would have different value in that scenario. No, because there's nobody to pick from. You can't. There's very little. I would disagree with that. I think there is. There's a very lot little of people players. out there. Well, games change. You can't say right now. Right now, yeah, you're right. Yeah, because, I'm 100 right. Because it's not happening as much in college. Because they don't need to. Because they're going to the MLB and they don't have to hit. So they stop doing it. I mean, every game transcends. You used to not see college players, big guys, ever shoot threes. And the NBA started doing it, so now they're doing it in college. Like the right. game would adapt, but yeah, right now you're right. They couldn't do it. They'd have to give a time period and let that farm system yeah, change. But if you look at if you look at high schools, I mean, I'm going back to our glory days, Frank. The part reason why we were so good was because we had nine really good defensive guys and we had five really good pitchers. And guess what? Those five good pitchers. They could all hit too, because we all had to play defense. <laughs> exactly. So that's we didn't have any POs. If you, if you, if they were to change the rule, I don't think the game would suffer. If anything, it would probably get better because you would get better athletes that are you know that better understand the game. Because I think that's part of the thing that's lost is I can see that too. I can see that. You, you don't, you don't have pitchers hitting four batters a game. If but they you're have talking to go like there and saying at the plate exactly. ten years from now. <laughs> You're talking about kids that are just now picking up a baseball. That's when it's going to – if you change the rule now, it would take that long in order for that to be developed. I figure it out in three. Figure no. it out in 45 days. You can't – especially the way – with the way pitchers are nowadays, they're so specialized. Why? Right? Why? I don't, I don't know. It's just the way it is. It's all about numbers. It, it, it used to not be that way. So you have lefties on lefties – that people come in and just throw the left hand. Like you have guys in the dugout that are left-handed hitters that after the sixth inning, they're pinch hitting against a left-handed batter 100% of the time. And then they're coming out of the game. And I don't understand that. Like you're a professional baseball player. You can't hit a left-handed pitcher if you're right-handed. Like I don't understand that. So maybe it is the question, uh, reduce roster spots for major league teams. So you you have to, you only get, 11 players or not 11, but like in order to reduce roster spots, you'd have to drastically reduce the number of games played. I do think the games need to be reduced, but that's a lot of games. I'm just, my thought is we're having these issues. We don't have enough money. Why are you adding required positions? Why are you building that roster size? You have to have, if you can't pay the players that are there, I mean, I think that's a negotiating point they could have had. Um, I don't think DH is necessary. If right and left is an issue, make those the two leagues, have a right-hand league and a left-hand league, get rid of American and National. <laughs> There's a lot of things baseball could do. Oh, my goodness. Oh, what a good time. DH is uh, uh, definitely correct. I don't care what you guys say. Well, we all it's needed. let us know what's correct, DH or no DH. Do you, do, you, do you like the Universal DH or do you not like the Universal DH? If you like the Universal DH, just know that you're agreeing with me. If you don't like the Universal DH and you want pitchers to hit all the time for everyone, yes, you agree with Dave and Coop. And you would be wrong. All right. We're going to end that discussion. We're going to move on to um, a little bit of more of a sentimental time of the show uh the unfortunate news about the passing of quarterback Dwayne Haskins reached the airwaves was it yesterday morning uh Saturday morning 
Yeah, Saturday yeah. morning. Yeah. Um, I don't know what day it is either, fellas. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Dwayne Haskins was in South Florida uh, training with some teammates. News came out early Saturday morning that he was struck by a, by a vehicle. Uh, honestly, that's all the details that I know, and he unfortunately passed away due to injuries sustained from that accident. Uh, the NFL world was kind of flipped upside down for a small period of time. Uh, I know Joe Burrow sent out a lot of heartfelt social media posts to uh, his friends, family, and teammates. Um, Dwayne Haskins was a player for the NFL, played for uh, the Washington Redskins, Washington football team, Washington Commanders, whatever you want to call them. Um, most recently was on the roster with uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, expected to compete for a starting spot this fall. Um, do you guys have any more details about the Dwayne Haskins accident? Reading a little more on the report, um, you know, was with teammates. South Florida was supposedly cr- attempting to cross some lanes of Interstate 595 when uh, he got hit by oncoming traffic and there is an open traffic homicide investigation. So, you know, that's just probably a term at this point. I don't think anything is suspected. It's just extremely unfortunate. Uh, He was with teammates. Chase Claypool spoke out on that. Uh, So many people just, you know, pouring out thoughts and prayers. I mean, 24 years old ton of potential set numerous records at Ohio state. Just really, really unfortunate news to, to wake up to on Saturday. Yeah. I mean, life is precious and you never know when the Lord is going to call you. So just, you know, it's really sad to see a, a guy who, you know, we watched him at Ohio state thrive and, uh, had the world in front of him. So truly devastating. Yeah, it's super unfortunate when things like this happen because it kind of puts a damper on pretty much your whole mood, even though, like, me personally, I've never had a connection with him, you know, on any level. Like, I wasn't a Ohio State fan. Obviously, I'm not a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I didn't cheer for him, didn't root for him. But you know who he was. You knew he had a family. You knew he had friends. And you knew he was a young athlete with a lot to live for and just an unfortunate accident. Basically took everything he had away uh, in, in, in an instant. And that needs to go, it goes to show like anything can happen at any time. So you always need to be prepared in some form or fashion to, uh, to deal with things like that. And that's something that nobody ever wants to deal with. Um, But it is an unfortunate accident and our thoughts and prayers go out to the Haskins family and all of his friends and teammates as well. Uh, We know that that doesn't do a lot when people say thoughts and prayers goes out to these guys, but this is our respect to uh, those guys and their family. So, um, yep. Dwayne Haskins. Yeah, oh, and super, you know, super unfortunate. It's it, it's a good call out to everybody because you know we are we're three diehard sports guys, and it's really easy to get trapped in the mindset that these guys are just athletes. They're just yep. entertainers. That's what they do. You know, they have families. It it's their profession. Um, you know. I know uh, Adam Schefter is getting a lot of heat on the internet for uh, his initial tweet. I think he since now has edited it, but you know, it's uh, whenever people write their obituaries, they don't, their, their football stats aren't put on their obituary. So I think that's really important to kind of keep that frame of mind that just because he was a great athlete and maybe didn't have the NFL career that he really wanted to have, you know, it's, at the end of the day, he's a human just like us. His heart beats just the same. So it's it's important to keep that in your mind. Yeah, the hardest part about this whole thing is yet, right? He didn't have that career yet. Never. 24 years old. Like, he came in young. Um, Joe Burrow got drafted at 24, didn't he? 23 or 24. Like he, He's pretty easy. Guy, Joe Burrow and, like, Joe Mixon are about the same age. Yeah, so, I mean, just – so much in front of him, just had a kid. Uh, just unfortunate to see him lose those opportunities and have this happen to him. Yeah. Um, moving on to more football, Dabo Sweeney. Uh, been in the news lately a lot with the NIL, the transfer portal, things like that. Since all of this has come about, I don't want to be that guy, but Clemson hasn't been the same. They haven't been the same old Clemson. And pro- probably the reason being is because 
somebody like Dabo doesn't want to make adjustments to live up to uh, or to do what everybody else is doing, per se. Um, maybe Clemson doesn't have the resources to do that, but I highly doubt it. Um, Coop, walk us through uh, Dabo Sweeney and his comments recently. Yeah, so Dabo basically said that college football is broken. Um, he said, I think there's going to be a complete blow up, especially in football. There needs to be, eventually there will be some type of break in another division. What he's saying is the power five schools are dominating the smaller schools. They can't compete. They don't have the same budgets. They don't have the same priorities. And he thinks that that is going to happen. We're going to have a, a power five or a top 50 to 70 schools in one division and the rest of what's currently division one football in another so after touching on the conferences, Sweeney added that the name, image, and likeness rules are making it pretty much impossible for him to get anything accomplished. Uh, after last season, they had nine players enter the transfer portal. Dabo claims he is not a fan of gaining players that way. His transfer portal is in his locker room. He's not going outside. And thinks that pay-for-play is the valuing education he doesn't want to have to incentivize players to come to school so he's just got all kinds of problems with college football right now i think you nailed it frank when you kind of opened us up here and that maybe these weren't his problems when they started but he hasn't been effective since they came about so i don't know Dabo well he doesn't come to the acc coaches dinners with me and and roy when we sit down out there um so I don't know him on a personal level. I can't say he's, you know, finding a scapegoat here. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. Like Clemson may be having trouble competing in the new environment and he's either being stubborn and it's causing it, or he's saying he doesn't believe in it because he can't keep up with it. Yeah. I, I kind of torn be between picking that as well, because in my opinion, I think if Dabo wanted to, he could, I mean, he's won national championship. If you're a national championship winning coach, you obviously know how to get players to your school. Yep. And your old recruiting tactics now don't work. So all you have to do is put people in place there, like everybody else has done, to make it happen for everybody like that. So you have to have people organizing it for you. You have to be able to delegate the things that you want to do. And I just don't think that he's willing to do that. That's a lot of extra work. I think he likes to have his hands on just about everything that goes on in his program, which a lot of coaches do, and that's fine. But there has to be a certain level of trust. You have to go out and get people that can do that for you. That, and what we've done it for two years now. There's there's people out there willing to go to Clemson to do the same thing there for that kind of program. Um, yep. When it comes to getting recruits, I think he was already starting to lose out on a bunch of them anyway uh, to certain schools. And I said this about college basketball, but college football, the parity is in terms of there's like the top ten really that get – all the top recruits probably, and they're all mostly in the SEC. Um, yep. But like the teams in general, the team makeup, the general makeup, there is a huge disparity between the top of the league and the bottom of the league. But I feel like what he was talking about, the big schools breaking away from the smaller schools, I, we already had that once, right? Like you have the, the FCS, like the North Dakota States and the Villanova footballs and the EKUs and the, Murray, the Moorhead States. And the Murray State's like, you already have that. Like, those are Division One schools. There's, that's D1 football, but they're at a lower level. So, like, what would you do now? How would you pick? You know, what happens if you have, like, a, like a Nebraska, who is traditionally, you know, one of the greatest football programs of all time, but hasn't been in the last 20 years? You go and kick them to the curb and say, hey, you got to go play with the Little Dogs? Like, you can't do that. Yeah, I don't see how they can split it that way and then when you get into those schools i mean even if a school hasn't had football success if it's a big university they're gonna make how money do you how do you yeah how do you keep them out of that when they have the same credentials better enrollment you know they've got the athletic funds i don't know how he's going to split that but on the the transfer portal we're just seeing it increase and i think his reluctancy to look outside of his locker room is what's hurting them yeah because you can't compete with guys you bring in and then the guys that don't play, they're going to leave. Right. I mean, exactly. NIL means, Hey, I can go to a smaller school and maybe make some money and play. 
Mm-hmm. And why wouldn't they? They're going to get exposure. They're going to get experience. It might not be against, you know, the top talent in the country, but the ACC is not loaded in football, right? I mean, you're going to get more out of your practices at Clemson than you are when you go and play, I don't know, Georgia Tech. So I, I think he's going to have to adapt. We see coaches right now, they're phasing out. They can't do it or don't want to do it, you know, against their beliefs. Yeah. And if he doesn't change something, then Dabo may not be in Clemson for too much longer. I would say that Dabo is on to something, though. Um, the The transfer portal is flawed. I mean, every, every coach that has some sort of weight to their name has said it. And, you know, I was a college athlete. I transferred twice. I went to three different schools. I took a very different path. Well, in my time, it was different. Now it's kind of how everybody does it. But, you know, I, I played at Moorhead State. Well, never touched the field. But then I then I had to go to JUCO. I couldn't go to another Division One school or I would have had a set out year. And then even after my first year of school, I had to graduate from junior college or else I would have had to sit out another year. And now that they have changed that, the whole recruiting landscape has changed because you are no longer picking a school for a school or for, you know, a coach, even for that matter, you're picking a school because you're saying, hey, I can make money. I, I am, my name, image, and likeliness is going to get me to the next level, whether that be the, your professional sports or famous on TikTok or whatever. And or I think or like a, another career too. Right. Like you're, you're looking at opportunities for people to get into advertising let, let's say maybe like an investment firm. If you are a college athlete and you're majoring in business or marketing or something like that, and you get in with an NIL deal with a marketing campaign somehow, you already got your foot in the door while you're playing ball. You know, and Then after your ball is over with, you're going to have something to come back to. And you've already got those connections, and now you're, you're looking at that as well. Um, and I think, I, and I think that's, that's awesome for that to be available to players. But mm-hmm. I think the – the transfer portal kind of being the recruiting portion of it really has to be reevaluated. Yeah. Cause I, yeah. I agree with Dabo cause like you have to invest in your own locker room to make sure they don't leave. Cause he's went out and gotten number one recruiting class and they were in the playoffs for however many straight years. So he knows yeah. we all know he can do it. It's just the NCAA really needs to look to see, I mean, you have 1200 basketball players in the portal. How many, I don't know the average, but I'm assuming you probably get 500 freshmen come in each year. So that means we have 1,700 players that are going to be on new teams next year, potentially, I should say. Because some of those 1,200 are going to be done. And that's just the issue. They need to do something because it's, you hate to see just people leave. And it's like, well, it's just professional collegiate basketball now. Yeah. Or football. And the thing it hurts most is it's not the current college athletes, it's the high school kids. That's what it's hurting the most because you said, like, you had, what, 1,200 kids sitting in the basketball transfer portal right now looking for a place to go. They've already been Division One basketball players, so, like, they're obviously pretty good. They've already been recruited by one school. They're probably going to get recruited by another. But you have those kids just sitting there. So, as a college coach, why would I go looking at the high school ranks unless they're top tier? highly recruited, you know, top 25 player in the country when I can go look in this pool of players and find somebody that's already done it at the highest level and that I could maybe maybe coach up for a year or two to bring them to my team and make a difference now, not in three years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, like, yeah. you're hurting high school players. You're not going to hurt the top-tier players. You're not going to hurt the elite athletes, but you're you're hurting those – middle of the road type guys that are looking for a place to go and they're not getting those opportunities because of the assets that are already out there ready to come that have already been proven. Yeah. Yeah. And you it's know, gotta be really hard to govern because it's still an educational system. Yeah. Like how much can you dictate where a kid gets their education, which is, you know, kind of the underlying reason they're all in this extracurricular. Um, so accreditation may be something you could tie back to it. I thought to get a degree, which I know is not a requirement to play any sports. You don't have to graduate. You just have to be, you know, certain academic standing. But don't you have to have a certain number of credits from at least one single university so they can award it? Like you can't transfer in 75% of your credits from the three schools you already went to. 
Yeah, that would be pretty hard. I mean, people try to transfer credits from community college to a four-year university, and they have a hard time doing that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess what you could do is you could have some sort of system in place that every time you get a kid that graduates from your team with a degree, that's one free transfer portal ticket that you could have to go get a player from the transfer. Oh, you yeah, can't, no, you can't make kids commodities. <laughs> that would not yeah. go over well. No, no, no. <laughs> well, what a good thing. What a good time that would be though. You have all those guys at the end of the bench that don't do nothing but to graduate. You guys are here to graduate. You ain't touching the floor. I need four more new, four new players next year. Hit the books. No, that's worse than not that paying. Really, the thing that really screwed everything up was the additional COVID year. Yeah. I mean, COVID sucked. Don't get me wrong. We're, we're finally getting back to a little bit of normalcy. But the fact that they gave football and basketball an additional year of eligibility was absolutely stupid. I at mean, any fo- time, though. Like you could do it at any time. Yeah. But in, I mean, football played a full a, an entire season. They had a national yep. champion. Yep. Basketball, they stopped. They pulled the plug. At the at, tournament. At, at, yeah, right before the conference tournaments or conference tournaments and right before March Madness. So, I mean, they played a full year. And then baseball and softball and the spring sports, they're the ones that got shafted, and they're the ones that actually deserve the additional year. But then yep, you go yep. see, like, like it's crazy how many – like, Kentucky had uh, a, a six-year player. It's like, what? We usually have 19-year-olds, and now we have somebody who's 24, 25. So yep. I think that's – that I, – I said it when they first did it um, – I think I know some states did it for high school, which I thought was Kentucky did it crazy. Because I mean, no, no offense if anybody on in Powell County is doing it, Frank. But why would you want to be in high school for five years? I I yeah. don't know. I just it's nuts to me. So and I and it's that's include in just increasingly creating this log jam of talent in the collegiate record or level. So it's all just in shambles right now and mark emmert is underneath the microscope and he's gonna have to make some big changes this next year yeah uh we got time for one more topic uh we talked about this before the air um but uh the ever loving kentucky people love jj reddick um (laughs) I'm just joking. Uh, J.J. Redick was a really good basketball player for Duke University who most Kentucky fans do not like uh, because he was really good. Uh, when that No, I resent that statement. I am not a Kentucky fan. They did not dislike J.J. Redick because he was good. It was 100% a personality issue, style of play. He was very he talented was basketball player. Lightner 2.0 or 3.0 by that point. But yeah. anyway um, – JJ Reddick has his own podcast. Uh, very interesting, by the way. Uh, I listen to it all the time. Uh, he, I'm, we're still waiting on him to be a guest on our podcast, maybe one day. But um, uh, you guys have the quote, direct quote from uh, JJ Reddick, readily available? No, but I, I can spit it off. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. All right. So, you know, last week we went on our little rant about why the NBA sucked. And, you know, I swear JJ was listening. Because uh, sure, first thing when I flipped on my my phone on Twitter, he he's one not, of our thirty one subscribers. Right. He uh, I saw his basically response of why the NCAA sucks and why the NBA is gets bad a rep, bad reputation because of how the NCAA has failed to evolve. So if you look at it, them in comparison, a college basketball plays two twenty minute halves, NBA plays four I believe twelve minute quarters. So they have uh, eight extra minutes. I think I've got that math wrong. The, yep, it's, the NBA, it's eight extra minutes. Eight sure. extra minutes per game. The uh, shot clock in college games are at 30 seconds. Um, you know, recently just changed that from 35, and NBA is at 24. And right then and there, I mean, you have eight extra minutes off the top, and then you have six seconds less per each possession in – the talent in the NBA is way better than what it is in college. And that is why the NBA, you know, they, they are, they do play defense in his, it was one of his big things. It's just really, yeah. really hard to play defense against those guys. Um, but then he also talked about how the college basketball hasn't evolved and how, you know, they're still running the same sets that he ran when he was in elementary and middle school. So 
I, it was a really good piece out there, and uh, you should you should all go check it out and tell us what you think of does the NBA suck or does the NCA suck? I agree with him. I really do. Um, if you've watched college basketball, like uh, for instance, Jay Wright uh, or, or any the St. Peter's guys, the reason they were so successful is because they ran motion offenses, pick and rolls, screen and rolls, things like that. But they did it really good. We have teams that do those things that aren't good at it, and it it muddies up the water in in college basketball. And then when they get to the NBA, there is a little bit more space. Um, if you're more athletic and can shoot, there's more area to do things. Uh, I believe it was the same interview, if I'm not mistaken, that was with Kevin Durant. Yep. Um, Kevin Durant was talking about how um, these guys in the NBA scoring 60 and 70 points. He's like, I can't do that. Nobody lets me score 60 and 70 points. He says, if I get open on a screen at the top of the key and you sag off and I pull up and make it, do you think I'm going to ever get that look again for the rest of the game? He said, no, I'm not getting that look anymore. And yeah. what he was like, he just kept talking about how they, they do play defense in the NBA, but it's really hard to stop certain players based on their skill sets. And the college game hasn't really done that. Like you don't have, you do have superstars per se, but you don't have anybody like jumping out of the water since Zion, literally jumping out of the water, but saw how that's worked out so far. Um, I agree with JJ Reddick on that, on that issue. The college game hasn't changed. I can't remember anything different now, except for, you know, a few more athletic guys, a lot more threes being taken. That's for sure. But you don't yeah. see back to the basket type stuff anymore. It's kind of gravitated from that. I'll give him that. But uh, he's he's looking more in-depth at, you know, the plays that are being ran, defenses that are being ran, things like that. He sees it from a professional basketball perspective, a perspective that we don't necessarily have, uh, or I don't anyway. I'm not a basketball-minded person. But he look, he's looking at, like, the flow of the game and how things are structured and how, the, the, you know, the strategies are laid out to the guys and how that hasn't changed since he's played, which has been a long time ago. Yeah, I see both sides there. One major issue with college basketball is two halves. They are the only level of that, basketball. That's so stupid. Well, I don't know men why. or women's, internationally or domestic, that do two halves. FIBA is four quarters. NBA is four quarters. Women's is quarters. Like, it makes no sense to me. But I don't know necessarily that the game itself can get to the style of play of the NBA because they don't have the talent of the players. Right. I mean, you got 300 and some schools, not 30 of the world's best. They're in a four year range, not a 15 year range. It's just like in college football, you don't see, like, UK ran Wildcat for a season. Well, the Wildcat offense, pretty much, right? Lynn Bowden was yeah. quarterback. And you see a little bit of read option in the NFL, but you don't see that. Like, there's a disparity in talent, so you can't get to that certain style of play, but the styles they have haven't changed. You're right. Like, even I coached middle school basketball a couple years ago, and I was watching Jerry Tarkanian and UNLV in the 1990 season for a defense. Like, that's 30 years old, but it was still relevant. It was still applicable. Like, you could still teach it, and it was effective. And so, you know, I don't know if you could go back 30 years and watch football and have that those same comments. Okay. So it does need to change, but I think the talent is the biggest difference there because – you only have five guys on the court. So there's a huge difference between five guys at middle Tennessee state and five guys for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I would, I agree. And I would go one step farther and say, you have better talent on the sidelines uh, in that coach's box. Cause you can look back on it. How many college coaches could you say that have successfully transitioned to the NBA? I, mean, I can't know, think of one. We, we know that our big boy, John Calipari, he flopped. Brad you know, Stevens, maybe. Patino. I would say uh, Billy Donovan. I mean, he's he's been a staple in the NBA for about ten years now. So I mean, but it, <sighs> that's my that's my thought. My yeah. what I'm saying though is you don't see those coaches. Brad be Brad Stevens is the only one that I can see that would even and remotely I, call it success. Yeah, and I think most people would say he's underachieved with that roster oh, in Boston. For sure. Yeah, that's a good point. There's no pop in the in college basketball. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but if your college basketball coaches are successful because of the systems they run, and when you go to the NBA, 
you don't run a system. You you have your players and you run, you know, you run plays for your players. You don't run a system. Yeah, your your yeah. players have systems. And that's kind of why. I mean, look look at uh, Phil Jackson. I hope that's right. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> going to the Lakers, and then going to the Knicks. You know, the triangle um, offense didn't work. Whenever he went and be, did the GM stuff, and it's so he yeah. didn't have Michael Jordan and Kobe. Well, yeah, but you know, but it just shows you how the NBA is changing. And even when the guy who's won what twelve championships, or maybe not that many, but he's won. He's, double, yeah, he's double digits. He's, he's double digit, and even he is, you know, a dinosaur, so to say, in the NBA. Yeah. Mike D'Antoni couldn't keep a job running that seven second offense in Phoenix. You know, that's what started the three point trend in the NBA. And he can't keep a job. He's all over the place. He's here for a couple of years, there for a couple of years. And even he had the scheme that's changed the way that the game at that level is played. So, yeah, I think it's a great point. Yeah, man. Um, we're going to wrap the show up right there. We're about an hour in. Um, we want to thank you guys for tuning in again. This is episode eight. It's kind of hard to believe we've been doing this for eight weeks. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Again, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, help us out. Subscribe. Um, we're our, we are an ever-growing podcast, an ever-growing video podcast. If you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any other podcast avenue resource that you use, uh, follow us. Make sure you download the episode. That helps us out as well to help us grow. Uh, share it with your friends, like us on Facebook. We have, um, quite a few likes on Facebook, actually. Um, social media is weird, man. You can't get traction anywhere oh. doing anything. It sucks, but, uh, we're still having fun doing it. Uh, as always, we love you. You guys have a great night and have a great week. Um, anything else you guys need to add? Uh, if we get enough likes and subscriptions, we'll, we will consider starting a trifecta sports only fans. Try to get some viewership up. <laughs> so that's in your all's hands. We'll leave it up to you. Hey, I'm in. It's just me. me I'll be eating Doritos, but that's just me. Yeah, it will be sports oriented still, but balls everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got it. Uh, Wrap it up. Oh yeah. All right. I'm 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 stopping the recording. <laughs>